Okay, with a little luck, everyone can see this. And um, so we will be um, talking this evening about the trolleys of uh, Mercer County. Um, the talk comes in two parts, some assembly required. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the competition on what was really the biggest and most successful suburban trolley route in Mercer County. And that's the Trenton to Princeton route, which carried the most passengers. It was the only suburban route with two lines competing for the same traffic and it endured the longest. And the second part, we'll look at the trolley line that ran through Pennington and Hopewell. The Hopewell leg had the shortest lifespan of any of the suburban routes. So we'll have the longest lived and the shortest lived uh, trolleys in, the, in Mercer County. As I mentioned, there are two competing lines uh, connecting Trenton and Princeton. Uh, one uh, became known as the old line and the other was the Johnson line. So what I'm gonna start with is just a very quick introduction to each of these two to lay out their roots and then we'll come back and talk about the story of how they got built. So the old line first. So the old line was part of the far flung trolley system that operated in the city of Trenton. As with today's New Jersey transit buses, Trenton was the transfer point between lines. Eventually they had lines reaching out not only to Princeton, but also to Yardville, to Hamilton Square, to West Trenton, and of course, to Pennington and Hopewell. For much of its journey from Trenton to Princeton, the old line traveled on public roadside rights of way. So this is also the case with the other suburban lines. And as a result, the old line was slower and operated like a local. It took 55 minutes to travel from Trenton to Princeton. Also, the old line was strictly for passengers. The tracks were too wide to handle freight cars, but they did allow the trolley cars to be wider and more comfortable. So prior to the extension to Princeton, the farthest extent of the Trenton system was Princeton Avenue at Southern Street in Trenton, right here. From there, the trolleys came up Princeton Avenue, turned right at Paul Avenue, and then turned left at Brunswick Avenue. They crossed into Lawrence here on the east side of Lawrenceville Road, today's US 206. And they continued along Lawrenceville Road through Lawrenceville Village on Main Street. And then when they reached the Shippetalkin Creek, they turned right east and traveled along the south side of Fackler Road right here until they reached Princeton Pike. They crossed Princeton Pike and traveled along the east side till just past the Princeton Township line, which was here. And then they sort of uh, left the roadside behind and took off cross country, passing over the Stony Brook here and briefly traveling along Quaker Road and then turning toward Princeton along the eastern edge of the Princeton Battlefield, the eastern edge of today's Institute for Advanced Study campus and the eastern edge of today's Springdale Golf Course. They intersected with Alexander Road at approximately the traffic light at Faculty Road, then turned up Alexander Road to go into what was then Princeton Borough. So they turned off Alexander at what is now University Place, the former location of the Wawa. They continued past what is now the old Dinky Station and to a trolley siding and waiting room that was right adjacent to all of the tracks of the Pennsylvania Railroad that came directly into Princeton. So that's a quick look at the old line. And now on to the Johnson line, which is quite different. It was not part of the Trenton streetcar system. It ran back and forth between Trenton and Princeton and that was that. And the end of the line in Trenton was the end of the line in Trenton. Although for many years, the Johnson line did provide connections across the river to the streetcar system in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. For almost all of its journey, the Johnson line ran across private land only at each end in Trenton and in Princeton did it travel along public roadways. As a result, it was faster and operated as more of an express. It could make the run in about 35 minutes. Also of importance, its rails were standard gauge and could accommodate freight cars as well as passenger traffic. And this is one reason that it was eventually acquired by the Reading Railroad. So the Johnson line had its Trenton terminal 
on Hanover Street between Willow and Warren Streets. So this provided easy access to the Calhoun Street Bridge for traffic to Bucks County. And it followed a public, uh, public rights of way, public roadways uh, along Hanover and Willow until it crossed Pennington Avenue. And uh, then it entered private right of way, crossed into Ewing across the west branch of the Shabakunk Creek right here and through what is today the Prospect Heights neighborhood in Ewing. It continued on private rights of way all the way into Lawrenceville Village. At one point, it crossed a farm lane uh, heading to the farm of Lewis Eggert, and that became known as Eggert's Crossing. In Lawrenceville Village, it uh, ended up only about 500 feet west of Main Street and its competitor, the Old Line. So they were very close convergence here in the, in the Lawrenceville Village. Then it continued across more farmland uh, on the way to Princeton, crossing Rosedale Road, Stony Brook, and the Great Road. Entering Princeton, the Johnson Line crossed uh, Bayard Lane, and then across what is now the parking lot of Community Park, turning back onto the public roadway at Witherspoon Street, approximately where the former Princeton Packet Building was. Uh, the tracks continued down Witherspoon Street to the end of the line at Spring Street, just short of Nassau. So that's a quick look at the Johnson line. I have uh, three maps quickly that compare the two routes. So this is the way out of Trenton. As you can see, in Trenton, the, uh, the departure points were actually very close to each other and fairly convenient. But in the vast wilderness between Trenton and Princeton, otherwise known as Lawrence, uh, they diverged quite a bit, except for the little part that came into Lawrenceville. And finally, they entered Princeton, where the ends of their respective lines were less than half a mile apart, one just shy of Nassau Street and one down University Place. So how did all of this come about? So we will start with the saga of the old line. So in the late 19th century, transportation infrastructure did leave a lot to be desired. If you wanted to travel from Trenton to Princeton via Lawrence, you would take a stagecoach. Today's US 206 was far and away the best road, and that was not saying much. It only became macadamized in 1895 and would not be paved until the 1920s. Trenton, meanwhile, had horse-drawn streetcars starting with the Civil War. There was an extensive track system within the city. The first of these lines was electrified in 1892 and the entire system by 1894. But the closest you could get to Princeton was the Princeton Avenue line, which as I said, ended just past Southern Street. The Trenton Street Railway Company is what they called it. They had ambitions to extend their lines into the suburbs and Princeton was on their priority list, but the route was also of interest to others. So our story picks up early in 1899. And yes, there were not two, but three trolley companies that were interested in the route. And they all realized that the first leg to be built needed to get as far as Lawrenceville Village. The first two competitors were the Trenton Street Railway Group and another group headed by former state Senator George Vanderbilt of Princeton. As we shall see, he was one of the few in Princeton who thought trolleys were a good idea. Both groups wanted to run on public rights of way along Lawrenceville Road, and obviously both could not, so the township committee had to make a choice, and the winner was the Trenton Street Railway. Senator Vanderbilt went off and started other railroads elsewhere in New Jersey, but was never heard from in Mercer County again. So February 23rd, 1899, Lawrence passed its ordinance, giving the trolley franchise to the Trenton Streetcar Group, which began building its line out toward the Trenton city limits. And meanwhile, lurking in the background was the third trolley company. Now, the New Jersey state law governing street railways on public road rights of way required them to get not only approval of the local government, but also agreement from 51% of the landowners whose property fronted on the roadway in question. So two months later, the third trolley company, which is called here the rival steam road, 
went to the New Jersey Supreme Court to ask for an injunction that would invalidate the Lawrence Ordinance. Certain landowners, it was claimed, had changed their minds. It appears that some of the farmers had discovered the fact that the third line was not going to run alongside the road and conveniently was willing to pay them cash for rights of way across their farmland. With the Trenton Street Railway, they would get nothing. So a few weeks later, they got their injunction and construction was halted. However, they did manage to sort it all out. There were technical problems with the ordinance. Uh, they were corrected. The original landowner consents were reconfirmed and the township committee passed a revised ordinance that was acceptable to the court. Note here that the third trolley line now has a name, the Sadler Company. So you should tuck that one away for future reference. So this was the first of what would turn out to be several delays in building the old line to Princeton. Almost three months were wasted. The new ordinance laid out the specifications for construction of the trolley line and it also set fares, 10 cents for a border to border ride across the township and five cents from Lawrenceville Village into Trenton. A month later, they had tracks laid out as far as the hospital now known as Capital Health. And on June 15th, 1899, the trolley made its ceremonial inaugural run all the way into Lawrenceville Village with great excitement and pageantry. Here we see the first trolley parked in front of Hamill House on the Lawrenceville School campus. So regular service to Lawrenceville began the next day. And a month later, they had extended the line out Lawrenceville Road as far as Shippetalkin Creek. The trolley line was a huge success. In August of 1899, the annual harvest fair at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville drew a record crowd of 2,000, which was more than the population of the township. But by this time, Princeton had made it abundantly clear that there was no way any trolley line was going to come into town along Stockton Street, today's US 206, more on this in a moment. So plan B for the Trenton Streetcar Group was to travel down Fackler Road and enter Princeton by way of Princeton Pike or Mercer Road as they like to call it. Now most of Princeton Pike in 1899, interestingly, was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad and so was Brunswick Pike for that matter. These had been private toll roads and the railroad bought the rights of way in order to keep other railroads from using them so as not to compete with the Northeast Corridor. And you can see where this is going. The Pennsylvania Railroad was not going to let the trolley company use its right of way. So on to plan C. At the end of July in 1899, the Trenton Group chartered a new corporation to build the line from Lawrenceville to Princeton. So without getting into too much detail here, the new company was created under a different New Jersey Railroad law that granted it limited power of eminent domain. So it had the ability to force landowners to sell it rights of way if it came to that. The new plan showed the tracks running along private land parallel to Princeton Pike until just over the Princeton Township line, whereupon they crossed Stony Brook, which is here, and sat out across farmland. By the end of August, service was in place as far as Stony Brook part of the Updike land shown on this map, you can see Updike, Updike, uh, became today's Updike Farmstead, which is headquarters of the Historical Society of Princeton. Uh, Princeton. I mentioned earlier that Princeton had sent a clear message that they did not want the trolley along Stockton Street. Their attitude is neatly summed up in this editorial from the university's alumni publication. This was published in 1894, five years earlier. So clearly this had been a worry of theirs for many years. Here's what it says. Another serious objection to the road would be the running of Sunday excursions, which as a matter of course would follow such a move. This would make Princeton more or less of a Sunday resort to all outsiders, an objection that can be not be impressed too forcibly. Our campus would become a picnic ground for the lower element of our neighboring cities and troubles of various sorts would follow in consequence. Less publicly noted as an objection was the university administration's fear of exactly the opposite. 
providing Princeton students with easy access to the pleasures of Trenton. I suppose they could have built a wall, but who needs a wall when you have Moses Taylor Pine? For those of you who may not know him, Pine was a longtime trustee and major benefactor to Princeton University. He has not one, but two campus buildings named for him, as well as the Pine Prize, which is annually given to the top undergraduate scholar. He was also a trustee of the Lawrenceville School and a township committee man in Princeton and the son-in-law of Major General Robert Stockton. Pine was born to wealth, banking and railroads. He had a private train to take him to New York when he had business there. And he lived right on Stockton Street at a little place called Drumthwacket. So Pine was a classic practitioner of what we today call NIMBY, not in my backyard. And he had a big backyard. To Pine, trolleys were just fine as long as they came nowhere near him or his property. In any event, Pine had gone on a real estate shopping spree to make his backyard even bigger, buying up all of the land anywhere near him that might provide a right of way to the trolley line. This report from the New York Times says he had already bought three farms and was trying to buy more. But ultimately, the Trenton Group, with its power of eminent domain, prevailed. In October 1899, a route was negotiated to cross farmland and enter Princeton via Alexander Street, what was then called Canal Street, near the Pennsylvania Railroad Freight Station. But it still wasn't over. Some landowners refused to sell, and so the matter went back to New Jersey Supreme Court. Finally, in late January of 1900, Supreme Court forced the owners to sell. So in May of 1900, service began as far as Alexander Road. Now the trolley company had to go to Princeton Township to get a right of way to run along the short stretch of Alexander to the Princeton Borough Line. This approval was finally secured six months later in November 1900. And finally in February of 1901, Princeton Borough Council granted the last 2,500 feet of right of way to bring the trolley line to its terminus. Service all the way into Princeton began April 29th, 1901, almost two years after service to Lawrenceville had begun. So it took two trips to New Jersey Supreme Court, a fight with the Pennsylvania Railroad and a battle with the aristocracy of Princeton, but the old line was finally built. This shot here is from some years later, but it serves to remind us that the Alexander Street Railroad Yards of Princeton were very much an industrial zone in the early 20th century. This is the trolley line running right along here. This 1926 photo shows the Princeton end of the line with the then new Dinky Station right here. McCarter Theater would later be built here. So in the final analysis, Princeton was unable to keep the trolley out, but it did manage to keep it from coming in through the front door. It came through the service entrance instead. Now we can look at a few images of the old line in operation. We'll start at the Princeton end and work toward Trenton. So this is the Princeton terminal in about 1908. This is along Fackler Road where a farmer picked up some spare change by advertising to trolley riders. This 1922 photo shows the tracks along today's US 206, which still had not been paved, uh, heading south toward Lawrenceville. Here are the trolley is stopping in Lawrenceville Village. As you can see, the tracks are on the east side of the road. This is a circa 1915 view looking toward the bridge at five mile run from about the intersection with Dara Lane. Today, you'd see the Adath Israel Synagogue right about here. Here are tracks in the Eldridge Park neighborhood. This appears to be Lawn Park Avenue. And finally, here is Paul Avenue in Trenton. Here you can see tracks going both ways, but for most of its route, the old line was single tracked, which meant that sidings were needed to allow trolleys traveling in opposite directions to pass one another. Okay, so now we will turn the page and tell the tale of the Johnson line. And for this, we need to reset our clocks back to 1899. 
So do we remember the Sadler line? These were the folks who filed the first Supreme Court challenge to the Trenton Group when they were trying to get to Lawrence. That was back in April 1899. Their challenge failed, but they began building their line anyway. The Sadler line was not originally designed to be an electric trolley. It was envisioned to be a steam powered railroad that could haul both passengers and freight. And it was headed by a local man called Wilbur Sadler. It was financed by the heirs of Philadelphia philanthropist Isaiah Williamson. The Trenton terminus was not actually in Trenton. It was in Ingham, at Ingham Avenue just across the Ewing Township line. And this was not especially convenient for passengers. Sadler began laying track over private rights of way in April 1899 and by July had reached Lawrenceville Village in reality just a few weeks after the old line had arrived. At first, Sadler was chiefly a freight line, but soon they began running a stage service to bring passengers from downtown Trenton to their Ingham Avenue terminal. This service ran for about a year, while Sadler and his group began building trolley lines over in Bucks County, connecting Morrisville with Yardley and plans to connect that service across the river to Trenton. More than a year later, in September of 1900, the Sadler line started building from Lawrenceville toward Princeton, and they reached as far as Stony Brook by the end of the year. So at this point, you may be wondering your, to yourself, wait a minute, I thought this was the Johnson line. Uh, who is Sadler? What is he doing here? Where is Johnson? Well, here in central New Jersey, when you hear the name Johnson, you usually think of Robert Wood Johnson and the J&J &J Johnson family, but these are different Johnsons. Our trolley Johnsons are two brothers from Louisville, Kentucky. Older brother Tom is on the left, younger brother Albert is on the right. Tom was the practical brother. He was an inventor, a businessman, and ultimately a successful politician elected to Congress twice and for several terms as mayor of Cleveland. Albert was the more, shall we say, impractical brother. He dreamed big dreams. Now the streetcar lines in Louisville, Kentucky, where the brothers grew up were owned by the DuPont family. And Tom Johnson went to work for them. While he was there, he invented the fare box design that became the standard. It was Tom's idea to put glass around the sides so the conductor could count how much money had been dropped in. With the proceeds from Tom's invention and a loan from the DuPonts, the Johnsons moved to Indianapolis and took over the streetcar business there. And young Albert joined the company to learn the ropes. Meanwhile, Tom Johnson patented a design for streetcar rails that became the standard for trolley lines all over America. He started a company that had a monopoly on manufacturing these rails. And here is the Johnson Rail Manufacturing Plant in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. By 1890, Tom Johnson was a millionaire. Albert Johnson, meanwhile, was much more interested in building and running trolley systems. From Indianapolis, he branched out to the Lehigh Valley, to Brooklyn, and was even involved in building parts of the London Underground. But he was also interested in baseball. So we will take a brief detour to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, where we will meet John Montgomery Ward. Ward was a pitcher and shortstop in the mid 1880s, and he later founded what amounted to the first baseball players union, which was called the Brotherhood. Unsurprisingly, he felt the baseball owners were exploiting the players. And after a few more years, he had a brainstorm. Perhaps the players should form their own league, a league of their own, to compete with the existing owners. So in 1889, he founded what became known as the Players League and went off in search of investors. And guess who he found? That's right, Albert Johnson. Albert became an early advocate and spokesman for the Players League and was involved in two of the franchises that they proposed for eight cities in Cleveland and in Brooklyn. Albert Johnson's idea was that owning a team and building a stadium were fine things to do, but the real money was to be made in running the streetcar lines to the stadiums. This idea was not original to Albert, 
As this poster for an old stadium in Cleveland shows, it was built by the streetcar team owner along his trolley line. The 1896 Cleveland Spiders, they're a pretty good team. In particular, they had this impressive pitcher uh, called Cy Young. Anyway, some of you may know how the historic link between trolleys and baseball continues to this day. The Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers, named because of the convergence of trolley tracks near Ebbets Field. Anyway, John Montgomery Ward's Players League did not make it past its first season and Albert Johnson returned to his streetcar businesses. He moved to Brooklyn and was making a lot of money there, but he had even grander plans for New York. In early 1901, Albert Johnson announced that he wanted to build a trolley line connecting Philadelphia with New York City. He would cross Staten Island, tunnel under the Narrows to Brooklyn, and then under the East River to Manhattan. And he was basically laughed out of Brooklyn. His plan even warranted an editorial in the New York Times and not an especially favorable one. Mr. Johnson is very voluble. He talks about 10 times as much as serious and responsible men are in the habit of doing when engaging in large enterprises. Nonetheless, Albert persevered and began trying to assemble the pieces of his Philadelphia to New York trolley route. And for piece number one, the Johnson brothers bought the Sadler Trenton to Princeton steam line, all of the Sadler holdings in Bucks County and the Calhoun Street Bridge and they kept Wilbur Sadler on to manage the system. There's Wilbur. The Johnsons immediately began planning to electrify the system and complete the line into Princeton, and then something quite unexpected happened. In July of 1901, Albert Johnson died at the age of 41. So just as John A. Roebling did not survive long enough to see the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge, so Albert L. Johnson never lived to see the completion of the trolley line that was to bear his name. It fell to Tom Johnson to try to sort out the pieces of Albert's trolley empire. In August of 1901, construction began to extend the line from Stony Brook into Princeton. In November 1901, the first trolley reached the foot of Witherspoon Street right here. In May of 1902, construction began to bring the line down Witherspoon from the Princeton Borough border. And the first trolley ran to downtown Princeton July 17, 1902, about a year after the old line had arrived in Princeton. But the trip was faster and the fare was 10 cents to Trenton, as opposed to the old line, which was slower and charged 30 cents for the same trip. Thus began a long competition for cheap fares that did nothing to enhance the financial viability of either of these lines. But there was still work to do at the Trenton end. Remember that the line only went as far as Ingham Avenue. Passengers had to take a stage from there to get to downtown Trenton. In August of 1902, they requested permission to build their line down to Hanover Street. And by November of 1902, they had got as far as Willow Street and Pennington Avenue, which was close enough for them to discontinue their stage service. Progress was slow. They had to build a new bridge across the DNR Canal. And building across the tracks of other railroads and other trolley lines was always perilous, often resulting in fights sometimes in riots. But a year later, November 1903, they began service to downtown Trenton with two new car barns, one at Willow and one at Hanover. So now we'll take a look at a few images of Johnson trolleys. Here's a trolley arriving at the Witherspoon Street terminus. And here is a freight car at the same location another trolley approaching Spring Street in Princeton, and a car crossing Bayard Lane. And here is the siding uh, along the Princeton borough border. So the houses in the background here are on Witherspoon Street. Here is a car crossing Stony Brook. And this is the stop in Lawrenceville Village on James Street. Uh, these are the tracks running through Lawrenceville. This building here was the waiting room and power station that was built in 1901. 
Here, a trolley cruises uh, past Ingham Avenue in 1938, and here is the Willow Street car barn in 1939. The car barn was located here. This is Pennington Avenue here, and this is North Willow here. Uh, and here is a car turning from Hanover onto Willow. We'll see this image again a little bit later in the talk. And this is the car barn on Hanover Street. This is a Princeton trolley here on the left. These are Bucks County trolleys uh, here on the right. You can see that they were more of a trolley gauge. They're a little bit wider than the Princeton car. And the Hanover Street terminal was located here just to the west of Warren Street. The trolley lines were an important part of life here for the better part of three decades. Some of the effects were simple but important. In 1900, for example, the old line began bringing the mail and the newspapers to Lawrenceville. Getting enough power to keep the trolleys running smoothly was always a problem. In 1902, the old line had to install a storage battery station near the corner of Princeton Pike and Province Line Road. And in 1912, this was upgraded to a booster generator. In 1909, the Johnson line built a substation on the Lawrenceville Pennington Road and brought a 13,000 volt line to connect with their main power plant in Yardley. Around the same time, Tom Johnson, who was by then mayor of Cleveland, gave up on Albert's trolley lines and sold everything off. The Johnson line was taken over by a Bucks County group who in turn sold it to the Reading Railroad 20 years later in 1929. The trolleys were an important part of the lives of local student populations in Princeton and Lawrenceville. The most profitable days for the trolley lines were the days of Lawrenceville or Princeton football and baseball games. As you can see from this notice in the Princeton student newspaper, less than a week after the old line reached Princeton Borough, it was already in use to transport students out to Lawrenceville. Nonetheless, some of the worst fears of Princeton came true. Old Nassau became a weekend destination for Trentonians. Said the Daily Princetonian in 1901, the campus on pleasant afternoons and evenings, particularly on Sunday, is filled with people who have come here on the trolley. On Decoration Day last year, it will be remembered the campus was turned into semi-picnic ground, and we had the pleasure of seeing these people parading up and down the walks, making themselves very much at home. If this is allowed to continue, our commencement evenings will be utterly spoiled by having so undesirable a crowd mingling with our guests, and the Princeton campus will become no more or less than a public park for Trenton. And the rest of the worst fears of Princeton also came to pass. Trenton became a weekend destination for Princeton students, as evidenced by this ad in the Daily Princetonian. And this place was especially handy if you missed the last trolley back to Princeton and needed to sleep it off. But Trenton was not the only draw. Lawrenceville had its attractions as well. One farmer on Van Kirk Road ran a still and was a key supplier to Princeton students during Prohibition. They would take the Johnson line out to Van Kirk to pick up their hooch and return to campus. But the trolleys were important to more modest scholars as well. The trolley systems were important for student transportation, not only to bring high school students to Trenton and to Princeton in the days before at Lawrence High School, but also for transportation within Lawrence. Because of its proximity to the trolley lines, the Lawrenceville Elementary School had a large number of its students arriving by trolley, and the school district began buying trolley tickets in bulk in 1912. In its last few years, the Johnson line relied on student fares for income. It became a de facto school bus. And there were always operational issues. The trolleys did not play well in the snow. In 1913, for example, a Johnson trolley was stranded in a blizzard for an entire week. All the passengers walked to a nearby farmhouse and stayed there until the tracks could be cleared. And there were the inevitable accidents, especially in the early days before people and horses got used to the idea that these fast moving machines could come zooming out of nowhere. And with crude signaling systems, trolleys were prone to colliding with one another. 
One of the most memorable crashes occurred February 20th, 1917, when two old line cars collided along Princeton Pike near the township line. The trolley lines hit their peaks of ridership in the early 1920s. It's hard to believe today, but in 1921, the Johnson line carried 1.6 million fares. But as automobiles became more popular, the trolleys became less so. But interestingly, what really sealed the fate of the trolleys in Mercer County was not so much the automobile itself, it was the road improvements that drivers demanded to accommodate the flow of traffic. In 1925, Lawrenceville Road connecting Trenton and Princeton was paved for the first time. Main Street in Lawrenceville Village was widened and the trolley tracks were moved to the center of the street. This cost the old line money at a time when ridership was already declining. In addition, road improvements made it possible to introduce safe and reliable bus service, which was also more economical to operate. The suburban trolley line between Pennington and Hopewell was first to go, replaced with buses in 1924. 1929, the New Jersey Department of Transportation announced that it was going to install a traffic circle at Brunswick Avenue on the Trenton Lawrence border, right where the old line ran. If you're familiar with the circle, you realize that this diagram is upside down. This is actually toward Trenton and this is actually toward Lawrence. Matter of fact, for a couple of years, the trolley actually did run right through the middle of the traffic circle. So if you went all the way around, you would cross the tracks twice. This aerial photo from uh, 1930, right before the old line tracks were taken up, you can see where the trolley ran right through the circle there. Under pressure from the state DOT in 1931, Trenton Transit announced it would replace the trolley with buses between the Trenton border at Mulberry Street and Fackler Road in Lawrence, where passengers would then board the trolley for the ride into Princeton. Ironically, the same Princeton that had fought so hard to keep the trolleys out of town was now fighting to retain the trolleys and avoid those dreaded buses. The bus lines were told that they could run the buses through Princeton only if they did not open their doors while there. The final trolley of the old line ran down Main Street in Lawrenceville on July 26, 1931. Later in that year, Princeton finally relented and the last trolley into the borough ran on December 29th. And from 1932 on, it was buses what was then called the P line for Princeton through many changes of ownership to Trenton Transit, to Capital Transit, to Mercer Metro, and now New Jersey Transit where the 606 bus carries on the tradition. By the end of 1934, all of the Trenton Transit streetcars had given way to buses. And here you can see them removing some old line tracks north of Lawrenceville Village around 1932. Emboldened by the success of Trenton Transit in closing down its trolley system and with annual ridership down to 380,000 fares, in 1934, the Reading Railroad requested permission to close down the Johnson Line and permission was denied. Since the Johnson Line for the most part ran over farmland, it had managed to avoid a lot of the road improvement headaches of the old line, but in 1939, it was hit with a double whammy. Trenton announced a plan to repave Willow Street. And rather than rebuild its tracks, the Johnson line abandoned the tracks and moved its terminus back out to the car barn at Willow and Pennington. On July 31st, 1939, the last Johnson trolley left the Hanover Street terminal. In fact, this was the last trolley ever to operate on the streets of Trenton. That same year, Princeton Borough announced plans to repave Witherspoon Street and the Johnson's line response was the same. They moved their terminus back out to the foot of Witherspoon. In 1936, in order to cut costs, service had been reduced from 20 daily trips down to 13. So with ridership now under 300,000 and the Trenton and Princeton stations well aware, away from their respective downtowns and much more inconvenient, the Reading went back to request permission to abandon the line. And in July, 1940, they finally got it with the provision that the line remain open for diesel freight service as far as Lawrenceville. 
So on Halloween night in 1940, the last trolley left Trenton for Princeton and returned shortly after midnight. Between Princeton and Lawrenceville, all of the tracks were taken up and the wires came down. However, the Reading Railroad continued to run its freight line into Lawrenceville for many decades with several deliveries a week of coal and grain. This uh, 1963 aerial photo shows the line and its two major stops. One was the uh, Lawrenceville Coal and Ice Company, today's Lawrenceville Fuel. They were the local supplier of heating coal because until 1968, the Lawrenceville School was heated by coal and was a major customer for the railroad. But coal use was declining and by the early 1970s, there was only one customer left on the line and that is this feed mill here on the Lawrenceville Pennington Road. But once again, history was to repeat itself and road improvements sealed the fate of the Lawrenceville branch. The New Jersey Department of Transportation was constructing I-295 through Lawrence. This image is looking west from the interchange at Route 206. You can see the trolley tracks crossing right here. NJDOT had budgeted $2 million to build an overpass that would take the highway over the railroad line. But then they found out that the Reading Railroad had only one customer on the line, and they persuaded the Reading to abandon it. The persuasion was apparently in the form of a $10,000 check. This put the feed mill out of business, but it saved the state $2 million. January 26, 1973 saw the last freight delivery to the feed mill, and that was the last time that railroad wheels rolled down those tracks. Now, if you go out today, you'll see that between Trenton and Princeton, there are still plenty of places where evidence of the trolley lines persist. So we'll take a little tour, starting with the old line. So this is the US 206 bridge across Chabacunk Creek near Notre Dame High School. You can clearly see the abutments from the old line bridge on the east side. Just north of Lawrenceville Pennington Road um, is this bus stop cut out. This was once the location of an old line siding where cars were able to pass one another. Here in the back 40 of the Lawrenceville School, someone repurposed an abandoned rail as part of a bridge. At Chippetalkin Creek, the remnants of the trolley bridge can be seen adjacent to the Fackler Road Bridge. Both, abut both of the abutments and the pier are visible there. And at uh, Stony Brook, the abutments and piers of that bridge are also there and are readily seen from Princeton Pike uh, when the trees are bare. That's actually Princeton Pike in the background. The Historical Society of Princeton is in possession of some old line rails that turned up during an archeological survey of the Updike Farmstead. Then the trail that begins at the Princeton Friends School and continues behind Princeton Battlefield follows the old line right of way. It travels through the Institute Woods and emerges at Olden Lane. Bridge abutments can be seen at the Springdale Golf Course near the 10th hole. And finally, the Princeton waiting room for the old line has been repurposed by the university. This building here, the platform was over here parallel to the street. As you can see here, this is the same building. So that is what is left of the old line. Now we'll go back to Trenton to trace the Johnson line. At the Northwest corner of Hanover and Willow is an old trolley pole. In fact, it is almost certainly the same trolley pole as seen in this 1930s photograph of the intersection. So here's a close up, the top of the pole. And here is the pole still standing. Much of the right of way between Trenton and Lawrenceville is still visible because it was used for freight until 1973. In Ewing, here's the bridge across the west branch of Shabakunk Creek, right off the Home Depot parking lot on Olden Avenue. The only remaining tracks cross Olden Avenue at Fifth Street in Ewing in the Prospect Heights neighborhood. The right of way is still used as a trail north of Spruce Street in Ewing. This is Stout's bus company here on the right. 
The trail crosses into Lawrence over the east branch of Shabakunk Creek and continues on a paved bike trail along Johnson Avenue through the Eggert's Crossing neighborhood. And here is the original Eggert's Crossing. The trail continues behind Ryder University where this bridge was built using the original abutments from the trolley bridge across Five Mile Run. Then on the north side of I-295, the trail continues into Lawrenceville Village. At Lawrenceville Pennington Road, you can see the building that used to be the Johnson Line Power Substation from 1913. Some details showing ports for wiring coming into the building. This building has subsequently been painted white. And then in the village, this was the old Johnson Line waiting room, which had been painted white but has recently been restored by its owner to look much like it used to look in the day of the trolley. This is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like today. The trolley right of way crosses township property off Bergen Street, north of Cold Soil Road, and it crosses Shippetalkin Creek. You can see the bridge abutment dated 1931 in the familiar Reading Railroad Diamond. The right of way continues on private land crossing Van Kirk Road near the Terhune Pick Your Own Apple Orchard and continuing up this driveway. It crossed Stony Brook near the Johnson Park Elementary School in Princeton, not the trolley Johnsons. You can still see a couple of the piers here. This is what it looked like with a trolley on top. And you can see all of this from the, uh, from the Johnson Park School driveway. The Johnson Line right of way is now a bike path behind the school connecting out to Elm Road and the right of way picks up again on the bike path next to Community Park and then through the parking lot. And as our Johnson Line tour began with a pole in Trenton, so it ends with a pole in Princeton on Witherspoon opposite Quarry Street right next to the cemetery. Today, several miles of the Johnson Line have been transformed into walking and cycling trails in Ewing, Lawrence, and Princeton. Even a piece of the Lawrence Hopewell Trail follows the Johnson right of way. The possibility exists that more can be done. Several years ago, Lawrence Township commissioned a study to see if a bridge could be built across I-295 to reconnect the northern and southern ends of the Johnson trolley line. There is now a task force actively pursuing this idea. Members include the Mercer County Transportation Management Association, the Lawrence Hopewell Trail, the East Coast Greenway, the Circuit Trails, the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia, and the Tri-State Transportation Campaign. That's a real who's who of local transportation. So let's hope they can get something done by building a bridge across I-295 to connect the two parts of the trail. Uh, if you would like to know more about the plans for a bicycle pedestrian bridge over I-295, it just so happens that there is an online meetup tomorrow evening at six o'clock. And I'm gonna ask Kim uh, to please put the registration link in the chat box uh, for those of you who might be interested in attending that. So that's the story of the lines that connected Princeton and Trenton. Now we're going to turn our attention to the Hopewell Valley. The story is not quite as circuitous and complicated. I would also note that the story of the trolleys in the Hopewell Valley is not that well documented. So if you have any relevant material, I'm sure that the Hopewell Valley Historical Society would be happy to hear from you. The trolley line that served the valley was part of the Trenton Street Railway System, the same system that owned the old line between Trenton and Princeton, as well as the other suburban lines in the county. The Trenton system operated a trolley up Pennington Avenue as far as Prospect Street in 1897, and then all the way to the Ewing Township line in 1898. In September of 1902, the Trenton, Pennington, and Hopewell Street Railway Company was chartered and absorbed into the Trenton system the following year. The line was built as far as Pennington in July of 1903, and the first car ran from Trenton to Pennington on Independence Day. The tracks hug the old alignment of today's Route 31 from Trenton all the way to Pennington on the east side of the road. The caption on the back of this photograph says it was taken when the trolley first reached Maine and Delaware in Pennington. 
uh, whether this is actually the 4th of July celebration, we don't know. And now I suppose I must address the elephant in the room. Um, not something you see every day in Pennington, but this time you can see that Main Street was cobbled and the trolley tracks were running down the middle of the street. Having reached Pennington, the line started building toward Hopewell in late 1903 and early 1904. It followed today's Route 301 as far as Marshall's Corner, then turned to follow Pennington Hopewell Road, entering Hopewell along Broad Street and terminating at Elm Street by today's Blue Bottle Cafe. Here we see workers laying track coming down the hill in North Main Street in Pennington. By July 1904, the line had reached past Marshall's Corner to Glenmore, where there was a passenger station serving the Reading Railroad. And the first through trolley service to Hopewell began in October 1904. Finally, the citizens of Pennington had a relatively easy way to go get a beer. The round trip fare from Hopewell to Trenton was 25 cents, and the one way trip took 55 minutes. Trolley excursions through the countryside were promoted by the Trenton system, and really it must have been a lovely ride. We know that trolley riders were not welcome in Princeton, but there is no indication of any hostility in Pennington or Hopewell. Trolleys here were also subject to the whims of Mother Nature. These photos were taken south of Pennington. I guess pictures of trolleys in the snow must have been a thing. Looks like it's gonna be a long day. The trolley line to Hopewell lived the shortest life of any of the Trenton suburban lines, 20 years. As I mentioned before, the Hopewell line was first to replace the trolley with a bus, that was in 1924, and the bus provided direct service from Trenton. Passengers did not have to take the trolley to Pennington and then transfer. Pennington service continued until the Trenton service shut down all of its suburban lines in July 1931. So the residents of Pennington enjoyed trolley service for 28 years. So what traces are left in the local landscape? Not that many, but they are there. South of Pennington, the traffic circle, the interstate, and the widening of Route 31 have pretty well obliterated any trace. But between Pennington and Hopewell, you can still see some remnants. In general, the rebuilding of bridges is not good for the preservation of trolley artifacts as, residu as residual abutments tend to get destroyed in the process. This was the case with the rebuilt railroad bridge on North Main Street in Pennington. This is what it used to look like. Some of you may recall looking south toward Pennington and you can clearly see the wide abutments that used to support a parallel trolley bridge. Now with the new bridge, that's uh, they're, they're now gone. However, one trolley artifact can readily be seen in the railroad trestle that leads to the quarry across Route 31, just north of Rosedale Mills. There is a separate opening for the trolley on the east side of the highway. And if you look closely, uh, you can see that the trolley opening has a slightly higher clearance than the main bridge. This was to accommodate the overhead wires. On County Road 654, north of Marshall's Corner by the Country Club, there is a slight widening of the shoulder. This is all that's left of the trolley siding for the stop at Glenmore, where passengers could connect to the Reading Railroad. Now, just south of here is where the Pennington Hopewell Road and the Reading Line and the trolley line and Stony Brook all intersected. There are prominent trolley artifacts there, but when you see them, it's helpful to understand how that intersection evolved over time. The earliest image we have is this postcard from sometime prior to 1916. So this photo was taken from the Pennington Hopewell Road looking toward the two bridges. The trolley bridge is here in the foreground and you kind of make out the uh, railroad bridge, the Reading Railroad Bridge, um, which is the old bridge before the current stone arch bridge was built. As you can see, the dam at Moore's Mill had created this large pond, mill pond at Stony Brook. Now this aerial photo was taken after the stone arch was built around 1916, but it does show an earlier alignment. By this time, the Stony Brook uh, mill pond had been drained. It had occupied this area here. So here are the railroad tracks. 
Here is today's Route 654 coming from Marshall's Corner toward uh, Hopewell, passing under the railroad bridge. With the old bridge, the road uh, had crossed tracks at grade. However, the trolley tracks here diverged from the road, crossing Stony Brook here, and then reconnecting with the road over here. And the trolley bridge was pretty long because it previously had to traverse the width of the mill pond. So the postcard photo that we saw a minute ago was taken from about here, looking backward toward the two bridges. So as you travel toward Hopewell, if you look to your left, just past the railroad bridge, you can see what remains of the piers of the trolley bridge back in the woods. And this is the abutment of the trolley bridge between the railroad bridge and the current highway bridge. This diagram was prepared some years ago by a Hopewell Valley High School student, and it shows the alignments. When 654 was realigned, it was, um, it was moved to the uh, it was moved to the west. Uh, this is where it used to be prior to 1929, and then it moved over here. The trolley line is marked in red. You can see here the um, you can see here the bridge piers that are still uh, still there. Um, and so you can see the trolley had to cross the highway twice: once once here, and then again once on the other side. Not the safest thing in the world. So that's the story of trolleys in the Hopewell Valley. I would like to thank you for uh, joining us here tonight. Uh, thank you to uh, Kim and everyone at the Pennington Library for uh, organizing this. And thanks to the many people and organizations who helped me with the research. Um, this group from uh, for the uh, Trenton Princeton lines and of course the group uh, who helped me a lot with the Hopewell Valley research. And so I guess let's, uh, let's hear some questions. Thank you so much, Dennis. That was very interesting. Um, as I mentioned before we started the program, I know very little, or I knew very little about the trolley um, in this area um, before this program. And we do have numerous questions from uh, Donna Raskin. Let me see if I can forward some of them to you. Um, Donna was wondering if the trolleys were segregated and also whether women rode them alone. Those are excellent questions and I don't know the answer to either of them. I do not believe that they were segregated, um, although I don't know that for sure. It would, it would have been very unusual for them to have been segregated. And there's certainly, I have certainly in all my research have never come across that. As to whether or not uh, women rode them alone, uh, that I don't know. Okay. We'll have to look more into that. Maybe we can get back to Donna soon about that. Now, Dennis, you mentioned that there were a lot of people who used the trolley either for education, for school, or for pleasure. Um, what about work? Were there a lot of people who commuted from maybe Trenton into the Princeton area and vice versa? Um, as far as we can tell, there was some of that, um, but, uh, but it was not, uh, it was, there was not as much uh, commuting for work purposes. Uh, people in Trenton, if they wanted to, uh, if, they, if they wanted to live in the suburbs, would move, uh, would not move much farther than, than Lawrenceville at that time. However, the, uh, there was quite a bit of subdivision development in Lawrenceville uh, along the trolley lines during probably the 19, in the 19 teens primarily and into the 1920s. So that was a, an area where there's a lot of housing development, but not, uh, but not enormous, but, uh, but that really helped to spur the development of Lawrence Township as a, um, as a, a suburban uh, location, as opposed to being just a farming community, which it primarily was. It's very interesting because you think of our public transportation now being so um, such a pivotal part of work commuting. So that's that's interesting to know. Now you mentioned something about someone having a private train car to New York City. Um, do you have any information on when trains began to run from Trenton, Princeton to New York City? Um, someone else who's looking may may know more about this than I do. I know that the I know that the Pennsylvania Railroad ran 
trains on what is now the Dinky Spur from the main Northeast Corridor line into Princeton uh, in, the, uh, in the late 19th century. So I think that goes back probably to around 1880 or thereabouts, plus or minus. Um, so if you if you wanted to take the train from from Princeton to Trenton, you could take the take the spur branch, which was right now it's just a single track with the one train that goes back and forth. But uh, but it used to be multi-tracked, and there used to be a lot of traffic on that uh, on that line. So you would take that out to the main line. Uh, and then uh, transfer to a train that would take you down to uh, the, the train station in Trenton. But that would have been a much longer ride even than taking the stagecoach directly. Okay, interesting to know. I just wanted you to know also, uh, Dennis, that um, James Claver wanted to note that I was once the Hopewell High School student that prepared in set 1A. A oh, great job in the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, James. I'm glad. I'm glad you got to see this. I'm glad you heard about it. That's, I'm. I'm very pleased to have you here, James. James is uh, when he was. Uh, this was been back in the 1970s, I think. Wow. Uh, did a did a remarkable uh, research project when he was a student at Hopewell Valley High School, and the uh, the document is is a is a trove of good information. Um, uh on the on the uh the trolley systems it's the original is is in the files of the uh, of the historical society of princeton if anybody wants to look it up that is great what a small world it's true now we have a question um from someone about whether this recording will be available later and uh it is being recorded and so um we will at some point, it's on my to-do list, my long to-do list, to make it available for people later. Terrific. Any other questions? Dennis, when you said that the, um, in 1940, when the trolley was then used for, um, for freight, um, were there any common, like changes necessary to the tracks or to the trolley cars or? In order well, the to the, uh, the uh, as I said as I said at the at the beginning that when the Johnson line was first built, it was built using standard gauge tracks so that it could be used for freight. So they did not have to make any changes in it. They could not run freight cars on the old trolley, on the old line trolleys. But the Johnson line was always uh, was always built so that it could handle both freight. Uh, when it was electrified. Uh, they had uh, they had uh, freight cars that were actually electric freight cars that would run on the line. Um, later on, uh, after after the uh, trolley was uh, stopped operating, then it became diesel service, uh, and so diesel uh, diesel engines would would pull the freight out to Lawrenceville. Okay, James has a question: Was there any thought to using the Mercer and Somerset right of way between Hopewell and Pennington? Um, and he said he's imagined it was in fairly good shape in 1899. Um, I don't know how good a shape it was in. I mean, it was um, it was really built primarily for the per. Well, we're not going to get into the frog wars tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other lecture. But um, but the um, uh, I don't know what shape it would have been in. That would have been probably, when was the, when were the Frog Wars? That was early 1880s, I think, or late 1870s. So that was probably 15, 20 years. I don't know how much of that right of way was still was still there. I mean, the, the, the line did run out from Hopewell to uh, through Pennington. The, uh, the old station is still there in Pennington uh, on the uh, on West Delaware, on the uh, across from the uh, Hopewell branch of the Mercer County Library is actually where the where the station was, and then continued out. Uh, but it crossed, uh, but it didn't really go toward Trenton. It went uh, went further further west where it crossed the Delaware River. So I don't know. I don't know. We have more to research. Uh, looks like we have a request. Frog wars next. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some real experts on frog wars at the uh, Hopewell Valley Historical Society, so we'll have to track some of them down and, and pass that information along to you so you can contact them. We'll, we'll take note of that. So, uh, oh, Claudia has a question. Did Princeton University really go to Trenton to go to bars? Was Princeton a dry town? 
Uh, well, it 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 was Princeton was not a dry town, but for the uh, for the students, it was much easier to do what they wanted to do anonymously if they went to Trenton. Let's put it that way. Different times. <laughs> yes, very much so. All right. If anyone has further questions, please pass them along to me. Many of you have my email. Um, I will definitely forward them to Dennis. And Dennis, do you have any other comments? Oh, just thank you very much. Uh, good to see everybody here tonight. And, uh, and uh, it's always fun talking about trolleys. They never grow old. Yes, that is true. They're so much fun. And before we leave, I just wanted to let everyone know that I will be sending you in your email a survey, as we usually do at the end of these programs. We welcome any of your comments, um, your suggestions. In fact, we love it when you send suggestions to us to give us ideas for, for more programs. We're always so excited to get additional ideas. Um, but I also wanted to let everyone know that next Tuesday evening, a week from today at 7 p.m., we have uh, the return of arts educator Janet Mandel, and she will be speaking about Auguste Rodin, uh, many of you know Rodin, of course. Rodin led sculpture out of the wilderness of 19th century academic constraints and paved the way for the modernist of the next generation. In this illustrated lecture, his work will be examined in the context of his fascinating life story. And of course, as with all of our programs, you can visit penningtonlibrary.org to register. So thank you, everyone. Oh, you know, right before we leave, I just wanted to say, I wanted to share also uh, that Ruth here wanted to share an article about um, the trolley car recently found in Hamilton House. So I'll just share this link with everyone right now. Yeah, that was very interesting. That was a, uh, uh, some, some people bought some property out there and, and, uh, and there was a house that they wanted to demolish and they found that inside the house was, uh, the house had actually been built around an old trolley car that was probably from the, uh, from the Trenton streetcar system. And this was out in, out in the area of grounds for sculpture. So it was probably a car that had been used on the uh, on the line that went out that way, because wow. there was a line that went out to the New Jersey State Fairgrounds, which is where that uh, what used to be there. But well, that's a first. Mm -hmm. Building your home around a trolley car. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope everyone has a nice evening, and we'll see you hopefully next week for our next Zoom session. Good night. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dennis. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>